All right, wow. This is, yep, this is still here. There's people, oh, there's people. I've been very used for a long time to be talking down the barrel of that camera at much closer quarters uh, and getting to a Sunday and then we press a button and it plays. I've got to talk now. Um, seriously, in a moment, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 18. Uh, but I'm just reflecting, I just want to kind of, maybe it's just building off the back of what's already come this morning, just feeling it is great to be stood here speaking both to you guys in the room and to you guys at home now, if you like. We haven't, this, is, this, is, this is a momentous moment. Over the last year and a half, we haven't done a live preach. It's always been recorded. And we're now here. Some of us here in the room, you guys still watching in at home all together. I was praying this morning as we gathered to pray. I think this is this very significant moment. And that's not just about well, we're meeting together again. That's significant. That is significant. That's hugely significant. But this is significant for us as a people. What is God doing amongst us? What is God doing amongst us? We take this, uh, this step together. We're moving into a, a new season, a different season. As a church, we're taking this little step into, well, we've got kind of maybe 50 of us or so in the room. We're still online as well. We're taking a step into something new. Nationally, there's kind of restrictions are easing and things are a little bit different and we're kind of making steps forward, but caution is still very much required. It can, it can feel a bit uncertain, a bit unnerving, maybe exciting. Maybe you're just bored of it all. Maybe there's a kind of sense of relief that we're kind of stepping out into something. But that can be, we can be a bit nervous, maybe a bit confused. What's actually going on? It was funny, I'd planned to say this and then Pete prayed it in the prayer meeting this morning. Just, it came to mind, that sense of Neil Armstrong stepping onto the moon and saying, one small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. And then I looked up an article that said, did he say a man or for, anyway, people started analyzing what he said it's like but one there's this kind of sense we're taking i'm not comparing this to stepping onto the moon well maybe i am i don't know we'll make this comparison he takes this the, the symbolism there he takes this tiny step but it's huge we've just stepped onto the moon a giant leap for mankind and we're taking a tiny step here today we've invited kind of 50 people to come and join in the room. We've been online only for kind of months, a year plus. We're taking a step. Does it feel significant? Actually, maybe it does feel significant, but maybe in some ways, actually, particularly if you're still watching at home, does it just feel a bit kind of the same? Maybe here, we're looking around and saying, well, maybe it feels a bit significant, but actually, maybe it just feels like, well, hang on, there's only 50 of us here. What's going on? It's not like it was before. This is a big moment. As we were preparing and gathering people to kind of think, how are we going to work this out practically? I, again, I had a picture of, of that sense of the people of Israel crossing the Jordan. And they're in the, they're in the river... And then I, again, this, this won't be brilliant exegesis of this. They're in the river, and you've got two banks of the river. One way is massively significantly the way forward. They turn around and go back the other way. That's a massive backward step into, no, no, what are you doing? Actually, I was kind of reflecting and thinking, probably the banks of the river didn't look much different from each other. The actual banks of the river. You're taking a step forward, and you step out, and you think... Well, this doesn't look much different. What's going on here? But actually, they've taken a step into something massive. This is, they're going into the promised land. They're going, in, they're going into the things that God's got for them. This is huge. But it might not look very different at the moment. Oh, we're back at the Jubilee Center. Okay. 
God's taking us on a journey. He has been taking us on a journey, and he's taking us another step of a journey. This is a step forward into something new. So as I was reflecting on all that, I actually thought this passage that we've landed on in Genesis 18, it's actually a great passage for us in this moment. We're going to read from Genesis 18 uh, and verse 16. We see Abraham talking with the Lord. In Genesis 18, verses 16 to 33. I'm going to read that and then I believe God wants to bring us three encouragements out of this this morning. Genesis 18, verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 there, He said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. We come to this interesting story. Abraham's just had this time where the three visitors turn up, the Lord meets with him, uh, and uh, it's revealed we had the whole conversation with Sarah and, uh, and the promise that they will have a son next year, this great blessing that is coming. And, and then these visitors get up to leave, and Abraham walks off with them, and they're looking down over Sodom from up on the hill. And we have this interesting conversation between the Lord and Abraham. We see the the two other visitors go off to Sodom. They're going to go and see what's going on. And we'll find out about that next time. And Abraham and the Lord are having this conversation. We end up with this quite kind of almost, if we looked at it in the wrong way, almost kind of comical conversation going on. It's like Abraham's kind of, It feels like he's kind of pushing his luck. I'll ask again, I'll ask again. He's kind of haggling him down gradually, 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 it appears. It's kind of really interesting conversation where Abraham's like, well, okay, you've said 50, but what about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And they have this back and forth as God says, no, no, if there are are even only 10 people in the city, I will not destroy it. Really interesting 
conversation, interesting passage. But what do we see here that I believe is so encouraging for us today? I'm going to suggest that what we see through this passage is we see Abraham's relationship with God. His incredible relationship with God, wonderful closeness in his relationship with God. And as we see that, as we see this conversation develop, we see Abraham's heart for what is this kind of city? Nothing to do with him in many ways, maybe Lot's there, but other than Lot, what's this city got to do with him? Kind of this foreign city, not part of his family, not part of his clan, not part of the chosen people of God in any particular way, but his heart is there, pleading for them. We see Abraham's heart for these lost people. And over and above it all, we see, we understand the mighty sovereignty and graciousness of God. God, the judge of all who does right. I want to encourage us with those three things. Even as we stand right here this morning, whether you're at home, whether you're in the building, at this moment, for us. So firstly, we, do, we see Abraham's relationship with God, Abraham's friendship with God, and the first encouragement for us, let us desire to know God more. We see Abraham's relationship with God. We've seen that in the build-up to this, God has chosen Abraham. God has called him out of his homeland. Abraham's trusted God and gone on a, a journey with him to a new land to a new place. I've already gone through some really interesting ups and downs. God's promised Abraham massive things. And we see and we hear from the New Testament, this is how Abraham is described. Well, not from, just from the New Testament, but further on in the Old Testament. We can look in various places and see Abraham, he knows God. Abraham is described as a friend of God's. We could look in James chapter 2, we could look in 2 Chronicles 20, or we could look in Isaiah 41 and verse 8 particularly, uh, where Isaiah is kind of proclaiming what God is saying to the Israelites years and years later. He says this, but you Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. This is Abraham, not even just Abraham, my chosen servant, Abraham, the one I kind of call Abraham, my friend. God's and Abraham, this relationship of friendship. And we see even in this passage, wonderfully, we've just seen the Lord and these angels have come and met and had a meal with Abraham. And now as they get up, Abraham walks along with the Lord and Abraham's able to to have a conversation with God, to have a conversation with the Lord. And what does the Lord say to him? Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? God draws Abraham in to his plans. God draws Abraham into the, this is what I'm about to do. Should I hide it from, no, no, I'm going to reveal it to him, to my friends, to Abraham, this one who I've called and chosen. And then we get this wonderful couple of verses in 18 and 19. Why is he not going to hide it from him? Because Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. We see this relationship. Abraham is called and chosen by God to follow him, to know him, to to trust him and to see, to, to walk in relationship with him and to see that God will bring about his promise. We see Abraham knows God. Abraham we see is in relationship with God, but Abraham knows him. Abraham knows God's character. He's got hold of something massive here as we come, as as God reveals what he's about to do. Abraham, I know you, God. 
Verse 24, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will he really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike than this. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? We could read it almost as an accusation. God, how, you, how could it be that you're going to do this horrible thing? Well, we can understand. Abraham knows God. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham's saying, I know this is who you are. I know this is your character. You, it's rhetorical in some ways. Far be it from you. You're, you're, not, going to do, you're not going to do wrong. I know you. You are good and just. Abraham knows God. He's got to know. He trusts him. He is. He absolutely knows him. So you see, God's chosen him and he knows God and Abraham knows him. And the wonder of that is that therefore Abraham can, has access to come before God and, and do what? Plead for the city. Abraham has access into this conversation. God reveals his plan to him. And he allows Abraham to ask the question. And again, and again, and again. And to keep asking the questions. To keep pleading. What if there are only 50? What if there are 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? Abraham has access to come right before God and ask and plead, no, God, what if there's only 10 people there? And God hears him, and God answers him. So I come back, this is our, the first encouragement to us. Let us desire to know God more. Let us recognize that through Jesus, we too are a chosen people. We're children of the same promise, the promise that God gave to Abraham. See those wonderful words in 1 Peter 2. I'll read it from my notes. But you are a chosen people, 1 Peter 2 verse 9, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is what God's done. We see he chose Abraham. He called him out. Abraham walked with him. Abraham was in relationship with him. Well, look what God has done for us in Jesus. The same promise. This is the outworking of the promise. Through through you, all nations will be blessed, Abraham. Well, yeah, I'm going to send your offspring. He's going to make a way that many can come in and know me. And know me and walk with me and trust me. We're chosen to be friends of God. That's who we are. If we're in Christ, that's who we are. Friends of God, able to to walk with him and trust him and come to him and and recognize the access that we also have. Those wonderful words again in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest, Jesus. I didn't need to say that. That's coming up in the, in the verse. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's the first real encouragement. We are chosen like Abraham to know God, to be friends of God. Let's relate with him. Let this be our desire to know him, to be with him, recognizing the access that we have to come into his presence and ask to get to know him more, but to ask and to plead and to bring our requests to him. 
Recognising that wonderful truth in, in Psalm 84, the psalmist crying out in Psalm 84, verse 10, better is one day in your courts, gods, than a thousand elsewhere. It's this our desire, this our heart to be with him, to walk with him, to know him. See how Abraham knew him. And secondly, let, I'd encourage us, let us have hearts of compassion. We see Abraham's heart crying out for the city of Sodom. Out of his relationship with God, Abraham's less into this. He's given foreknowledge of this plan and we see Abraham's heart coming out. Now, we can see as Abraham responds, there's a passion for God's name. A passion for upholding and seeing God's name glorified. Far be it from you, God, you're not going to slip into doing something terrible. What would that be? But we see his heart as he pleads. He pleads for Sodom. What? Why? Well, perhaps because he knew Lot was there. But then he could have just pleaded for Lot. Oh God, as you go down to Sodom, my nephew's there. He's... He, Maybe he's got himself into a bit of trouble. I don't know why he's gone to the city, but he's there. Can you spare him? Actually, Abraham's plea is much bigger. Actually, if you find 50 righteous people there, will you spare the whole city? Even if you find 10, spare the whole place. We see a heart. For these people, a heart for a people who, it's not just, it's not just members of his family, it's not just part of the, the people who have already been chosen and are out where Abraham is. There's a heart for this city that he's already gone to the rescue of once before. A heart for Sodom and Gomorrah. A heart that they would be spared. A heart for the lost, for the stranger, for the alien. What we see is Abraham is echoing God's heart for the lost, for the stranger, for the alien, for all nations, for everyone. See a glimpse, see just a kind of note of the sense of God's promise to Abraham before, that through you all nations will be blessed. He's kind of living it out in his prayer, just starting to go there. No, no, God, will you spare them? Even as we see it in this passage in verse 18, God reiterating that promise. In verse 18, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. God's heart echoed through Abraham. Lord, would you spare them? So I'd encourage us, let us have this heart of compassion for the lost, for the, for the stranger, for the outsider. For those who don't yet know. For those who, have, who are maybe foreigners in a, in a strange land. For those who have come thousands of miles to end up in, in this city. For those in this city who don't know Jesus. I'd encourage us, what... Kind of looking at this, why are we becoming one church in uh, six hubs? One sense, we're quite happy as two congregations meeting, maybe three, three was on the way. It was quite comfortable and nice, but kind of we're moving forward a bit. But why, have, why are we doing this? Why have we gone, oh, well, actually, we want to be the church over there and over here and over there and over there and over there and over there. And over there. Because we want to reach this city. Because we want to express God's love to the communities that we're a part of. Because we want to see this is where God is taking us on a journey to show the love of God and his compassion to the people around us. I believe God's given us this vision to be city church in our local communities. Yes, to gather all together. Yes, to be here in this building. Yes, to come and celebrate. 
but also to be out there, to be in our communities, whether that's in our workplaces as well, in, in different places, but to be there expressing God's heart of compassion that we see just a glimpse of through Abraham here. Oh, Lord, would you save them? Lord, would you save them? Lord, would you help me to show compassion to them? Why are we doing it? To know God together, to support and encourage one another, and more and more to express his compassion, his love, his grace for the lost and broken people around us. To bring the good news of the kingdom. John 14, verse 12, is what Jesus says to his disciples, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. The works of spreading the news of the kingdom. Of bringing the kingdom in. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. I want to be those who out of this heart of compassion for the lost, out of this heart that knows God, in our words, in our deeds, in prayer, and in wonders and signs and miracles, are taking that message of the kingdom to those around us. To welcome strangers, to bring good news to the poor, to see healing, to see the marks of the kingdom spread, and to see people saved and added. To take up what Blessam was encouraging us with last week as part of what he brought in showing hospitality. This is what Abraham's just done here. Obviously, that's what Blessam was preaching. <laughs> Welcoming those three visitors. Reminds us of those wonderful words in Hebrews 13, verse 2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. God's at work in us, giving us this heart. Let us have hearts of compassion like Abraham as we step out into this new this unknown, this slightly uncertain, weird time of looking out at 50 people in a room and maybe another however many on a camera. Let's share Abraham's heart to save a city of lost people, people he didn't know, those outside of his own people and family. Let's be encouraged to go for it. And thirdly, let us trust the Lord of all. What do we see in this passage? We see a sovereign God who's in control. We see a sovereign God who has a plan and is going to do it. We see a sovereign God who knows what is right and is what is right. Abraham sums it up in that amazing phrase in, in verse 25. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the resounding answer to that question is yes. Yes. Always, always, always. The judge of all the earth will do right. The perfect God of all will do right. See, this passage, we see God's justice and also his heart of mercy. God is just. He does what is right. As he expresses what he's about to do to Abraham, he expresses it like this. The outcry, verse 20, against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. We see God who hears the cry for justice. We see God who hears the cry it says, this isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't good. He hears the cry of the wronged. He hears the cry of the victim. He hears the cry against the oppressor, against the wicked. He is the judge of all the world who does right. As we read further on in Scripture, we know that one day he will judge the whole world. For example, as Paul declares to the people of Athens in Acts 17, in verse 29. 
Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. One day, he will judge the living and the dead. One day, he will judge the whole world and he will do it right. And people can throw these arguments around and can have these complaints. How can, how can this be happening if there's a good God? How can God let this happen? Or even they can look back at stories like this and say, how could God do such a thing? Almost completely bringing the cry that Abraham's kind of hypothetically, not hypothetically, Abraham's rhetorically bringing, because he knows the answer, that God is good and he will do right. The bring the, how, could, how could the... the judge of all the earth, do such a wicked thing. And then say, well, he did, didn't he? Well, how can, they, how can God let this happen? How can, how can there be a good God if these things keep happening? But the message of Scripture is that we can trust in the fact that the God who is judge of all will do right. That one day, one day definitely, the living and the dead will be judged. Everything will come to pass. And we can rest assured that whatever God does, whatever God is doing, whatever we see in here, we see his justice and his goodness and his mercy. Let us trust in the Lord of all, who is judge over all the earth, who is the king over all, who is the one who is sovereign and in control. Can we see his justice? But actually we see his mercy. His desire to be merciful. This is who he is. If there is ten, I'll spare the whole city. You see, we can get the wrong impression. Is this the angry God of judgment in the background? A merciful Abraham looking to change his mind. Merciful Abraham saying, God, you sound a bit angry today. Maybe there's, maybe, you never know, there might be 50 people in the city. Could you just calm down a bit? No, Abraham's, Abraham's getting right to the heart of God. If there are 50 there, no, I won't. I will spare the righteous. I will do right. I will judge rightly because that's who I am. Abraham's not trying to twist God's arm here in that sense. He's not trying to pull him back from the brink of a really bad action done wrong in a vindictive rage. No, the, he speaks the truth in verse 25. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Always, 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 always. Perfect. Yes, he will. So let us trust in the Lord over all, the God, the judge of all the earth. He is good and he is just. We can trust him in everything. He is always faithful, as we've been singing already. We can trust him in this. We can trust him when we don't quite understand. We can trust him when we don't actually like what's going on. We can trust him when we are struggling personally. We can trust him as we step out into something that looks a bit weird at the moment. We've kind of gone through this thing where actually I'd be down here in middle, middle of the week looking at that camera and then we'd all watch at home on a Sunday. And now we're stepping into this kind of slightly funny thing where some of us are gathering here and we're hearing live and actually some of you are still on the other end of that camera. This is weird. This is uncomfortable. This is strange. But we can trust the God of all who will do right. We can trust him that he's got a plan and he's leading us through this and he is doing something amongst us and in us that is for good. When we don't understand, God is good. God is just. God is in control. we come into land I just want to encourage us again I've done the three encouragements let's wrap them up 
Let's go on an adventure with him. It's been great to hear, even in the room this morning, just the things stirring out of worship. Just that sense, it's a really funny experience being in a room with a mask on. Sorry, I shouldn't do that, should I? I'll do this, there we go. With a mask on, you can't hear me very well now. Singing along, not singing along, not singing along. Mouthing along, speaking along, thinking, I really want to be belting this out at the top of my lungs. But God's meeting with us, this is... Amazing. Wow. What's going on here? My prayer is that we're, we're all on a journey together. Whether you're on the other end of the camera or whether you're in front of me here in the room, God's taking us somewhere. Let's continue to get to know him. Let's know him better. Let's walk with him. Let's do what Abraham did. Walk with God. Get to know him. Know that we can come into his presence. Know that we can ask the question. Know that we can, know that we can get into this and know more. Get hold of his heart. And let's get hold of his heart. His heart of compassion for the lost, for the stranger, for those who are on the outside looking in, for those who are on the edges and the fringes. As we do this, as we work this out together, as we get into our communities together, as we look to grow these hubs that we've started, as we get into our communities day by day, as we go to work, or as we're on the, still on the other end of a Zoom screen at work, meeting with people. Let's keep our eyes fixed on him. And let's trust him, the God, the judge of all the earth who does right. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Just keep asking. Keep coming to him. So let's be encouraged to know him, to have his heart for the lost and for the nations, and to trust him. Day by day by day. It's also drawn to my attention this week that it's actually Pentecost Sunday. Remember the Holy Spirit being poured out on the early church. So I'm going to pray now, I think. We'll probably respond again in a minute. I'm going to pray. If you want to in the room, or you want to stand, then please do. You, but feel free to stay seated as well. I want to pray as we receive this encouragement that God will fill us afresh with his spirit. We've already been talking about it during uh, the worship time through Tom, through Helen, through others. We're standing here. I'm going to reiterate, I think this is a significant moment and I can't pin, and, and I think it's significant in the fact that I can't pinpoint what's significant about it. We're moving on, we're moving into something. It's like taking, a, it feels like taking an innocuous step onto a really nondescript bank of a river. Do you think, what? What is this? What, nothing's different. Nothing's changed. What's going on? But actually, God's moving us on. God's taking us somewhere. God's saying, yes, take this step. Take this step. Take the next one. Go for it.